<laughs> Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Bar Studio inside our Marriott International Headquarters building. We're here with a very special guest for our Geo Moment this week, Mr. Bernie Lovers. Hey everybody. He's global Whiskey Ambassador for Heaven Hill Brands. They are kind enough to come here and uh, host this amazing event for you. We are doing the Evolution of Bourbon. Yes. And uh, Bernie's going to be taking us through that. It's a cool little thing for everyone watching live. This is the first time we've attempted this, so please uh, be patient with us. Uh, but we have several copies of Bernie's book that he has uh, signed, and we will graciously be giving them away as a, a gift. So there'll be questions on the live feed for you to answer. First person to answer them correctly, we will make sure we get a copy of this book to you. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Bernie. Thanks, thanks Carl. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. It's great to be here. Um, it's it's uh, my first time here in the international headquarters. It's about time because I uh, Marriott is my preferred hotel of choice. So I'm very excited early this year to find that I went from platinum to titanium. That was cool. It sounds dang near impenetrable. So I'm really excited about that. So uh, super great to be here. So because I'm in your all's hotels a lot, in your bars a lot. So thank you for your for your interest and thank you for for uh, giving us the opportunity to uh, show these great whiskeys to you. Today is a unique tasting. When I came over to Heaven Hill Distillery about uh, 2012, you know, tastings is what we do as a whiskey ambassador. Uh, and it's like the cool thing about Heaven Hill and the whiskeys that we, we distill at Heaven Hill is that they tell a story. So usually when you're putting a, a whiskey together, it's, it's uh, usually what the brand teams want you to talk about, what, uh, what makes the most money, what's the most important, what has the most emphasis on it. And my God, we got to push this number this quarter, so you better talk about this. Well, that's not the way we do things at Heaven Hill. And Heaven Hill is a family-owned company, so it's, it works a little bit differently. The family owns every barrel of every whiskey. They want to sell every barrel. It doesn't really matter if it's the, you know, we're in the bourbon business, not the bourbon charity. So make no mistake, we're here to make money. But uh, it's, it's about, they're fine with me telling the story. You know, so this tasting is the evolution of bourbon, as Kyle uh, mentioned. And we're actually going to see, hear, feel, smell, and taste how bourbon became bourbon from unaged corn whiskey that Evan Williams and Elijah Craig was making back in the late 1700s. <clears throat> it's going to evolve into where that corn whiskey was first put into barrels down the, on rafts to the, uh, the Ohio and Mississippi River down to St. Louis and in New Orleans. And then we're going to find out different recipes, different grains, how that, that came into the equation. Then we're going to see the first laws that were put into, into effect. And then we're going to see what brought the category back after Prohibition in a long uh, s s kind of a slog through uh, the 50s and 60s and 70s. Uh, where bourbon was put on the ropes and we thought, as our owner Max Shapiro says, we thought it was going to that great liquor store in the sky. Uh, but it came back. So it's a, it's a great evolution of bourbon. And we use different whiskeys. It's another thing about Heaven Hill, we don't just make bourbon. We make rye whiskey like a lot of other people make rye whiskeys, but we also make corn whiskey. We also make wheat whiskey. We make malt whiskey. So because we're family owned and family operated, we can do things that most other companies can. And it's one thing to say you're family owned and operated. It's another thing to kind of meet the family. So uh, I don't know if we have pictures of the family here, uh, but I'll describe them to you. So as I want you to meet who we are and really feel what we do, who we are, why we do what we do. So we have the second generation of our family, uh, Max Shapira. Uh, he's about 74 years old. Max is a true icon of the industry. You, you might really not know his name, but his name is up there when you talk to other folks It'd be like Sidney Frank or uh, Sam Bronfman or Edgar Bronfman. These are, you know, Hiram Walker. These are true icons in the industry, and our owner is one of those, just a little more understated. Uh, he comes to work every day, comes in the office six days a week. He's the first one there. He's the last one to leave. He'll tell you he's never worked a day in his life, that he loves this industry. He loves what he does, and he just loves everything about it. And he's in touch. He knows I'm here today. I mean, if you talk to a president and CEO of a company, owner of a company, they don't know where everybody is. Max pretty much knows uh, what's going on in his business. It's really cool. And then you have his first, his father, Ed, and four uncles, they started this business. And they were never affected by prohibition. So in the 1930s, uh, as, uh, you know, early 30s and the late 20s, they owned department stores 
in little bitty towns in Kentucky, like Springfield, Kentucky, and Bardstown, Kentucky. And you had these little towns, I'm talking about Macy's and big, big stores. These are little junior department stores that are on the town square, right? And even in, during the depression, and uh, they, you know, you needed a, you know, a jacket, you needed shoes, you needed a hat. So, and of course they were not, they didn't make liquor or sell liquor, so they were not affected by prohibition in any way. So after prohibition's over, you have people who were been out of business for 14 years who are in the bourbon business in Kentucky and they're looking to get back to work. So they went to different people looking for backing and money. So our family, they, they approached our family, two members of the Beam family, Harry and Joe Beam, come to our family and they say, hey, we'd like to get back into the distilling business, but we need some money. And they say, well, we don't know anything about the distilling business, but we got some money, right? And we're willing to, to put behind this. So they invested $17,500, which is a lot of money to me today. <laughs> so I can't imagine what it was like in 1935. So they went ahead and they, they bought 200 acres of land in Bardstown, and that's where we sit today, in where the uh, Heaven Hill Distillery. They bought William Heaven Hill's farm. Now that's all one word, Heaven Hill. Uh, so William Heaven Hill, and we're Heaven Space Hill. And Max tells me, that uh, the family sent off, you know, they just invested $17,500. They, 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 they wrote off for the, the license in our state capital in Frankfurt, and they got the license back and it was wrong. It had space, heaven, space, hill. And they called up and said, hey, it's Heaven Hill. It's the Heaven Hill Distillery. And he said, no problem, but it's a $25 refiling fee. Right? And they said, we're okay with this for a while. Right? <laughs> <laughs> It was, you know, 25 bucks, this was several hundred bucks back then, and they had just invested 17,500, and they also knew that they were not going to uh, need to make a decision on that for a while, because they were gonna make bottle and bond, four-year-old bottle and bond whiskey, which means, you know, that's, that was the industry standard of the day. Before we're gonna learn about this in the tasting, the bottle and bond is the most restricted of all spirits in the world. So that was the industry standard coming out of the gate. And they didn't want to compete with Hiram Walker and Seagram's and Johnny Walker and Dewar's. You know, these Scotland and Ireland and Canada, they didn't have prohibition. They had age stocks ready to go on December 6, 1933. You know, prohibition's over December 5th. So they were ready to go. Well, who, wait a minute, you know, we, we got to build a distillery. And then, well, well, we'll fish in this smaller pond, which is, bourbon, rye, corn whiskey, American whiskeys, bottle and bond. We got four years to, to wait. We'll, you know, we'll make our mind up when we get there. Well, over time, over the years, they fell in love with the name, Heaven Hill. Sounds like a place. Sounds like a heavenly place. Who wouldn't want whiskey from Heaven Hill Distillery, right? So that's the, that's the story of how our, our company got founded. Uh, we came out with Heaven Hill uh, Bottle and Bond. It was a, a gold label, it's an old Heaven Hill. Uh, everyone's seen this bottle, whether you think you have or not, because that is the bottle of bourbon that Lieutenant Dan drinks during Forrest Gump, okay? And so that's pretty cool. And we did not pay for that product placement, trust me. Uh, but uh, that is a brand that, that would have been drank back then. And so, uh, and brands are kind of like children, you know? You never know which brands are gonna be successful on their own and which ones are gonna need help all their life, right? <laughs> so, you just don't know. They're brands, they're living, breathing things, right? So that was our flagship brand. All we made was American whiskey for the first 20 so years of the site. And Heaven Hill became the, 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 the number one selling bourbon in the state of Kentucky quickly in the early 1940s. So we were onto something. But, uh, then uh, we, we, were, we came out with another brand because whiskeys, they, you know, they mature in barrels. So they get, they get older as they mature. And also the market can affect that too. So if it's down a little bit, okay, so if sales aren't as brisk, as when the whiskey in the warehouse gets a little bit older. Right? So, you know, so you come out with older whiskeys. That's kind of how it works. You know, it's not like, oh, uh, you know, back, back, this thing of really overaged whiskeys or older whiskeys and stronger whiskeys, that's a modern phenomenon. That was not what the consumer wanted back in the 40s, 50s, 60s. They wanted four, five, six-year-old whiskey and that was it. 
My dad, who lived to be 94 years old and drank a quart of bourbon a day. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. that's a true, that's at least what, what you told the doctor anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> he was pickled, he wasn't going anywhere, right? But the, uh, uh, I told my dad and I got out of college and I said, hey dad, you know, there's these other great whiskeys that are out there because that's when the small batch and the single barrel bourbons were kind of hitting. And uh, he goes, ah, hey look, I don't trust a bourbon over six years old. I go, what do you mean trust? That's a big word. He goes, and this is in the 80s. He says, if it's over six years old, that's just the stuff they can't sell. So that's the consumer's mindset. Right? So if you have a bunch of whiskey that's sitting in the warehouse and that's, you're paying taxes on it every year. Right? And then in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and especially the 60s, that's when the one-two punch came in that really put straight whiskey down because we never really recovered after Prohibition. It was the blended whiskeys, like the Seagram Sevens, right? The Kesslers. Uh, it, was the, it was the blended scotches and uh, Canadians, like uh, Canadian Club and, and, Seagram's, and uh, uh, Seagram's VO. It was the Johnny Walkers, the Cuddy Sarks. Remember that? J and B. These were unbelievably huge brands. And you got Black Velvet. Black Velvet's still a monster brand today. I mean, these were huge brands, but they weren't straight American whiskeys. They were blended whiskeys or they were, and, and, they, and all that. They were younger. So if you're on a brand team and you have a bunch of stuff that's aging, that you're paying taxes on it every year, what would you do? What would, what would you do to sell this whiskey? It's in the warehouse. It's old. It's about eight years, nine years, 10 years old. How would you do it if you're talking to your brand team? Any ideas? Huh? Could, you know, could put an age statement on it, but you know that people don't want it. You could blend it away, and that would be a, a good thing to talk about. But then you're, you're giving away age. You're giving, away, you're giving away something, you know? So what they did was they put it into really cool collectible decanters. Yeah? So you remember all those decanters of bean bottles, and, and the I, I.W. Harper had these bottles. And um, I mean, Beam took it to another level because they, they owned a China company, a ceramic company. So they, they made them in cars, and they had Corvettes. And they had, you know, cool old, you know, Model Ts, and they had them shaped like telephones and all kinds of stuff. And you might collect the bottle, but you didn't, you really didn't care about the whiskey as much. And then they tried to disguise the age, because they didn't want you to know, right? So they listed it in months, and it would say, "This whiskey is 120 months old," because they know in Kentucky we can't do math, right? <laughs> so, and they go, wow, that doesn't sound that old. That doesn't sound like, you know, 120 months, right? That doesn't sound too old. That is eight years old or 10 years old. I don't know, but I, 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 that's a cool bottle. Right? So, and then you'll look at those old bottles. It says this whiskey is 150 months old. Some of them got as old as 160 months, right? And so, but the bottle was cool. And now it's some of the most collectible whiskeys on the market today because you can find them in antique stores. You don't have to go to a liquor store. You can go there. They're like chess men. There's all kinds of cool things. And they're older whiskeys from the old days. But back then, that's how you did it. So when Evan Williams came out, that was our answer, was to put it into a cool old decanter. And it was seven, we put seven years on. We put seven years, eight years, some of us nine years. But it was in a cool bottle. I don't, I don't, I've never seen one because it didn't last very long. It wasn't successful. <laughs> Because I guess when we put this, the years on it, who knows? But Ed, Max's dad, said, let's kill this project. We gotta do something else. And they said, well, let's give it a shot. So he said, well, the only way I'm gonna keep it, you know, because things were starting to, you know, they found, they found they just, there wasn't Wikipedia or Google, so they had to actually hire historians. They found that Evan Williams had the first license in our area, not the first distiller, but he had the first license. That's why they named it after Evan Williams. He said, the only one to keep it, let's just put it in the same square bottle that our Heaven Hill's in, and then no color on the label. So that's the sexy story of how Evan Williams was launched. Cheapest bottle, cheapest label, you know? And our flagship brand was going good, right? We didn't, you know, this was gonna be, this is a side project, right? And then over the years though, you know, as Jack grew, as Jim, Jim Beam was launched around the same time as Evan Williams, uh, you know, things happen, like I said, you don't know who's gonna be successful, who's not. And now our flagship brand is Evan Williams. It has grown to be the number two selling bourbon in the world. 
And so, but that's where we came from. Every success story has a tragedy. And our tragedy happened on November 7th, 1996. And uh, I'll just show you a little bit here. This is what happened on November 7th, 1996. This is our distillery in Bardstown. You see that? This is, a, this is a, a bad day. So this is when a lightning struck one of our rick houses. Our rick, our rick house is a big barn. Okay, it's seven stories tall. It, uh, it has, the barrels sit on ricks. And so there's a lot of wood in them. There's a half a million board feet of wood in each building. They're seven stories tall. They're wrapped in tin, sitting in the middle of an open field. It's not if you're gonna have a lightning strike, it's when. And when was that day? And it's happened before, it's happened since. But you just hope that it stays to one building. But you saw how it spread to the other buildings? Because those embers fly, you know what that building's full of? Wooden barrels, full of high-proof accelerant. Okay? So barrels were exploding. Okay? And there just happened to be that day 70 plus mile an hour winds. And that made the flames go from house to house to house. And then, kind of bad design looking back on it, but uh, the distillery was the lowest point of the property. <laughs> and so all that river of fire went down into the distillery. So we lost seven rick houses that day. That's 90,000 barrels, which happened to be 3% of the world's bourbon supply. And the ability to make whiskey, because our distillery burnt down. And we're a family owned company. That's a tough day for any company. Right? And so I asked, I, you know, I, I wasn't there. I was in Kentucky, uh, but I remember where I was that day. You know, it's one of those days. It's, like, it's kind of like the OJ, you know, Bronco chase or 9-11 or uh, the day that One Direction broke up. You know, we all know where we were. But <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, you know, I just remember that day great. So, but I wasn't at the company, so I asked Betty, uh, Betty Jo, who works at our company, and Betty Jo Hall Boone is uh, 60 years old. She uh, she's works at our company today. She's a champion barrel roller on our relay team. Every year in, for our bourbon festival, they have teams, because you know, in the rick houses, you can't have machines put the barrels into the, into the ricks. You gotta place those by hand. So uh, five to eight sets of hands, eight, five to eight people touch each barrel going in, and five to eight people touch barrels going out. It's very labor intensive, but that's what gives it the beautiful flavor that we have. Not everybody does it like that, by the way. We'll get into that. But that's how we do it. So Betty Jo was there that day. Uh, she's, like I said, she's a champion barrel roller. She happens to be Earl Beam's granddaughter, who uh, Parker Beam, you've heard of him, that's his father. So she works at our distillery today. I said, Betty Jo, what was it like? Because she's kind of the family historian, so I, I, I turn to her when I look for family stories in the Beam family. And she says, Bernie, uh, you know, we all got in the cafeteria because that was the biggest room that you could fit all the employees in. And the, every employee was there because, and she said, we all talked about it. He said, there's no way they're going to overcome this. We're just going to be out of a job. And she said, I'll never forget, Max walked in, Max Shapira, Ed's son. Uh, he was president at the time. He's our president today and owner and president today. He, to this day, still has lunch with every employee in the employee cafeteria. He takes his lunch to work. He heats it up in the microwave. He sits with, he has, I mean, he knows, he knows you, he knows your family, he knows their names. I mean, he cannot do undercover boss. Everybody knows Max, right? They don't care if he puts a beard and, and mustache on, they'll know Max. And he walked in, she said the room got deathly quiet and they thought they were gonna get bad news. And all Max said was, we're gonna figure this out. We don't know what's going on right now, but all I do know is in the building behind us, we have uh, orders to fill and customers to service. And in true Max Sal, he goes, no, I want you to say that back with me. He goes, we have orders to fill and customers to service. He goes, louder, like a coach. We have orders to fill and customers to service. Louder, and it's shaking. We have orders to fill and customers to service. He says, get back to work, and he walked out of the room. He said, nobody missed a job, nobody missed a beat. And even the people who worked in the distillery, who were clearly out of a job, they got moved to other places. They found places for them. And they did figure it out. And it was kind of the industry that, that, that did it. It shows you how cool the bourbon industry is. Because 
Parker's cousin is over at Jim Beam in Claremont. Booker, no. So Booker calls up, hey, Park, everything okay? You know, you know, I know nothing's okay, but is everybody okay? He goes, oh, yeah, we just lost some trucks and a couple cars got burned up, but everyone's fine. He goes, great. How can we help? I said, well, we need, uh, he goes, well, you lost seven rick houses. Do you need space? We'll rent you space. Uh, do you need time on stills? Uh, Lincoln Henderson calls over from Brown Foreman. Hey, uh, you need, you need uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make your whiskey for you. You know, we have plenty of capacity, so uh, we'll make your whiskey for you. Uh, then we'll fill the barrels. Um, Jimmy Russell calls over. Hey, Park, what's going on? Hey, you need two-year-old barrels, four-year-old barrels? You lost 90,000 barrels. We'll sell you some, right? Pretty incredible. You know, it's like, if Coca-Cola, you know, if Pepsi-Cola had a fire, I don't think Coca-Cola would call up and offer help, right? But they did in this case. And so um, we didn't just survive that. You know, the family was pretty well off. They could have just closed up tents, moved to the south of France and had a good day. But they stuck in there and they made, I mean, there's not a lot of jobs in Bartstown. This is a town of 12,000 people, right? The largest employers are the, are the distilleries in the area. So um, they made the investment. They got through it, and then um, instead of rebuilding down there, they didn't want to rebuild below the, uh, down under the hill again. So they bought a distillery in downtown Louisville. That's why the distillery today is in downtown Louisville, not in Bardstown, but our bottling facilities and, and warehouses are down there, rick houses. And um, we have expanded that now four times. We bought it, the year we bought it, um, the entire bourbon industry, the entire bourbon industry. So think about that. That's Wild Turkey, that's Maker's Mark, that's Jim Beam, that's Brown Foreman, Heaven Hill. The entire bourbon industry filled 440,000 barrels. The entire industry. Today, Heaven Hill at that facility, which is the world's largest bourbon facility, went from a burned down distillery to the world's largest single site bourbon distillery, fills 400,000 barrels on our own. And this family has stuck in there with, with, the, with the whole industry. They have passion for it. And so this is our time. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, it's like we're the Goonies, right? I love that movie, right? Because, you know, he says, you know, they're looking for Chester Copperpot. And he's down there. Mikey is down there. And they say and they can get, bring him up to the well. And he says, wait a minute. That's our parents' time up here. But it's our time. It's our time down here. Well, right now, with bourbon whiskey, this is our time. We're the Goonies, right? And so... We have now, because the family stuck with it, we have the world's largest single site bourbon distillery, still family owned, still Kentucky owned, and family operated. So Max, his daughter, is our vice president of marketing. Her husband, Alan, is our chief operating officer. And, and Max's son, Kate's brother, Andy, is our Western Divisional sales manager. Like Max, he wants to learn every aspect of the business because he's gonna take over for his father one day. It's an unusual company, and it's fantastic to work for. And so both Andy and Max had worked on Wall Street, so they know how it works. They know how uh, 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 you know, being owned by stock, the stock market and, and stockholders works. So that's where the brilliance comes in of the tact that they take to compete with the largest competitors in the, in the world, in the industry. And we have some pretty big competitors. Right? We have Diageo, who distill bullet bourbon. We have Brown Foreman, who has Jack Daniels. I guess not a bourbon, but come on, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a whiskey. We, it, it's in our market, right? It's, it, we got to acknowledge that, right? We have, uh, then you have Jim Beam, the largest bourbon company in the world. You have Wild Turkey. You, know, you have all these big, big, big people. And how does this little bitty family, who used to own department stores, right? compete with these folks. Well, they do things that those, those, those uh, companies choose not to do or just plain old don't do it. And they do that. And so I call that kind of our house style. Yeah. So this tasting in front of you is no other distillery can do. It tells the story of how bourbon became bourbon. Because everybody says, you know, what's bourbon? You know, well, bourbon's whiskey. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Is it, is, you know, is, I can, you know they say, they, my dad used to say, well, all, all bourbon's whiskey, but not all whiskey's bourbon. Right? You can say that about scotch, too, but about single malt. All, whis all single malt's whiskey, but not all whiskey's single malt. Well, what does that mean? And if, you, if that's all you can come up with, it's a pretty short conversation. Right? 
So it, it is a confusing category because there's lots of different whiskeys. There's Japanese whiskeys, there's Scotch whiskeys, there's Canadian whiskeys, Irish whiskeys, there's local whiskeys, there's blended whiskeys. So this tells that story. One of our mission statements that of our distillery at Heaven Hill is we make every style of American whiskey. So back in the day, everybody made an aged corn whiskey. They don't do it anymore because it's not a big category. So everybody made a rye whiskey. Very few people made rye whiskeys until just a few years ago. It was the next thing. It was, it's the next thing. It's still a huge thing. It's still a small little segment. It's one of the most like, it's like Irish whiskeys. It's on fire. It's, 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 it's on fire. But it's still a small segment. But it's a powerful segment. You know? If, you know, we'd rather be ahead of a curve than behind a curve. Eh? It's like everybody in business, right? If you knew what the next big thing was, wouldn't you want it? Eh? What if corn whiskey is the next big thing? And all of a sudden, because it's got to age it for at least four years, everybody else has got to wait four years. Guess what? We got one. Eh? Mellow Corn's a 5,000 case international brand. 5,000 cases. Think about that. Jack Daniels is like 17 million cases. This is 5,000. You can see why most distilleries don't keep a little brand like this around. And Max looks at this and family, they go, oh, Mellow Corn, what a cool brand. You know, love it, All right? Who else has our aged corn whiskey, you know, in their portfolio that is cool as Mellow Corn, right? And we're gonna taste, and we're gonna taste where it sits. And one reason that we have little brands like this in Rittenhouse Rye and Old Fitzgerald and J.W. Dan and J.T.S. Brown. We have a very confusing and cluttered portfolio. Like, how'd that happen? Well, when everybody else was going out of business in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, our family became the acquirers of brands, and they bought little regional brands. So in 1983, when Pikesville, from this area, around in Washington, D.C., and Maryland area, when they said, we gotta, we, we gotta close up, we gotta sell, who'd they call? They called up Max Shapira, and they said, man, we can't compete in this landscape anymore. But we'd let her have you buy this brand because we know you won't kill it. And so we did. And so we still have Pikesville Rye today. So it's pretty cool. When Rittenhouse Rye became available, they became the acquirers of brands. When Mellow Corn in the 80s was from Medley Distillery in, in Owensboro, we bought that brand. The genius of that is if you sell, if you don't screw it up and you sell 20,000 cases in this two, these two states and 40,000 cases in Florida and another 30,000 cases out west, well, it's probably going to sell that many next year. And it might not be under the Heaven Hill name or the Evan Williams name, but it's still whiskey that we make. And then, uh, you know, Fighting Cock does pretty good in South Carolina. They got the Gamecocks down there, right? So it does pretty good down there. You know, it's a pocket round. JTS Brown does okay over here. Well, you put that together, you, you got something. Huh? So that's why we have all these cool old brands. And we feel now we're the, we're the keepers of these historic brands. And I'm going to tell you now how they come and tell a story of how bourbon became bourbon. So any questions at this point of who we are? why we're here and what I'm doing here is I can't wait to introduce you to these great whiskeys. Right? So any questions on our family or our, or our business? Well, cool. Yes, sir. How many brands total do you have? How many what? How many brands total do you have? I don't even know. <laughs> uh, just a whiskey. And I, and I, I really don't know. Uh, I would say 50 or 60. Uh, and a lot of them are international. And uh, we got brands like, uh, called Daniel Stewart, Mark Twain, um, Virgin Bourbon, and things. Um, and it's, it's another interesting story. Well, if you're the only salesperson in your company, you're busy, right? And you have a national company. So Max Shapira, our owner and president, was the only salesperson for a while. Yeah. So you can imagine. That's why all of our brands were built in the uh, retail side of the business until just about five years ago, we started making a play for on-premise, you know, so bars and restaurants. So that's why, I mean, if we have the number two selling bourbon in the world, and we're not even in bars and restaurants yet, and that's, that's the exciting part of it, but this, it wasn't planned out this way. So you only had one, one sales guy, and that's Max. So he's, he's, you know, Benny's in Chicago call, you know, we'll do business with him, you know, there's just, you know, these big, you, know, you can only take, you know, he, he wants everybody's business. So people from Japan were coming over and people from, from uh, Europe were coming over in Germany and they're like, hey, 
We want to have our own brand. And he goes, well, we can't do that. We would know, like to sell you what we have, Heaven Hill or Evan Williams. Oh, we want our own thing. He's like, try to sell them on that. And before they left, he goes, well, what if I, because he's going to buy 1,400 cases, which is a container. Uh, he's not going to let that walk out the door. So he'd say, go in the label room. Where we, Gary's been in the label room probably. There's these hundreds and hundreds of brands that we bought over the years. Just pick one out. <laughs> so that's how some of these labels got around the world. And that's why I really don't know how many, because there could be something in South Korea that I don't know about that's some brand <laughs> or whatever. But it's, that's exciting, you know, that we have this, and now we're going to try to put all that business into, into building brands. But that's why uh, it's, it's, it's weird. That's why we have probably 20 to 30 around the country that are, that happened then could be 50, 60. So let's start this, uh, this tasting on this evolution. So in front of you, there are six whiskeys, and they're not bourbons. There are whiskeys. Remember, all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. Part of our house style at Heaven Hill, because we're family owned and we don't have to answer to Wall Street, another thing that we do, not just to make every style of American whiskey, because most, most, most distilleries choose not to, but aging, barrels and aging are the most expensive part. It also imparts the most flavor. And barrels are expensive, right? But here's one you don't have to age. Right? So this one is pretty profitable, right? Because we have far, foregone this aging part. The laws of whiskey state, you know, and I always carry a copy of the standard of identity. I think I'm the only ambassador that I know is that carry around, carries around the laws. Because I can't memorize everything, right? But if I carry them around, I can always got something to reference. But corn whiskey, the modern law of corn whiskey states that it must be made from a certain percentage of corn. Now, everybody in this room probably knows what bourbon has to be, what minimum requirements bourbon does. So I'll say it together. 51% corn. Does anybody know what corn whiskey has to be? 80% corn. Now, everybody thinks that's the big one. But a lot of bourbons are 80% corn or higher. So they could be a corn whiskey. The difference is what you age it in. First of all, corn whiskey does not have to be aged. It's the only whiskey I know that does not. That has a, it says if you age it. So this happens to be unaged corn whiskey. So let's smell and taste this. But it has the same restrictions as bourbon does and rye whiskey does because it has to come off the still at lower proofs. So this has to come, just like bourbon and rye, it has to come off the still at less than 160 proof. Don't worry about numbers here, but just know that the higher you bring, the higher proof for the alcohol per, per, per volume, and the highest you can get is 190 proof, like Everclear. Remember that party at high school? <laughs> like Everclear is 190 proof. That's what they brought that off the still as. That's neutral grain spirits. If you want to water that down to like vodka, you can just add water to it and boom, you're down to 80 proof and you got vodka, right? Yeah, that's one way to do it. Yeah. This comes off the still at 160. So the lower you bring something off the still, the more flavor of the, of the, of the uh, grains that you use stays in there. So this came off the still as everything does at Heaven Hill at 138 proof. So when we smell this, open your mouth a little bit when you smell this. This is 80 proof alcohol or 40% al uh, ABV. When you smell it, put your nose in there and open your mouth. You should be smelling corn. If you don't smell corn, you might be able to tell it's grainy, okay, at least. When you do taste it, put enough in your mouth to give it a chew. We call that the Kentucky Chew. I worked over with uh, Jim Beam for a while and uh, Booker No. Uh, he, he taught Fred, no, the Kentucky Chew. Fred taught me, and I'll teach you. So here's the Kentucky Chew. Mmm. When you chew it, it's like swishing wine, right? It gets it through your whole palate. But this is high-proof alcohol. Don't want to blow your head off, right? So if you just gently chew it, you should be able to taste it. What do you taste? You taste what you smell. It's corn. So this is corn whiskey. Comes in this jar, right? Because this is what people did in the South. Ever watch those Gator movies? You know, you know, with uh, with uh, Burt Reynolds in them and that kind of stuff. You know, you put it in, the, in those gallon jugs. 
And if you're gonna sell it by the quart, you would take those plastic gallon jugs and you'd pour it into, into a ball jar because everybody and on a farm, uh, they preserved fruits and vegetables and stuff. So everybody had this. So this is kind of the tradition of the South and tradition of, of um, you know, moonshine. But this is true corn whiskey. So unlike a lot of competitors in this area, you know, who, you know this, is a, this, is, this is not something you're going to have on your bar, right? Let's be honest with each other, right? But it's there. It's a, it's a, it's, people are buying this. And this really illustrates that you can't talk about what bourbon is until you talk about the genesis. So this is exactly what Evan Williams was making in 1783 on the falls of the Ohio River when we were, when we were Virginia. This is what Elijah Craig was making in 1789 when George Washington first took office in the, in, in the White House, when the, when the Constitution was ratified years later, when Kentucky became the 15th state in 1792. This is what folks were drinking, unaged corn whiskey. Why were they doing this in the first place? Is this something you'd sip and savor next to a fire with your friends? No, you might start the fire with it, right? <laughs> they did it because 200 years ago, when you woke up, it's tough. Life is tough 200 years ago. <laughs> it's not like we're here, we got, our, we got sparkling and still water here, right? <laughs> it's not like that 200 years ago. You woke up you know, with the animals 200 years ago. The rooster would crow and you're up and you got to go feed the animals before you feed yourself. What kind of a breakfast do you think you're going to have 200 years ago? Is it going to be warm? No, it's dark outside. And you just had the embers from the night before. You're not going to have a big meal. So you would have porridge or gruel, kind of like a soupy, kind of a, you know, grainy thing. You had bread and you had ale. You had ale or wine with every meal because water is the liquid of last resort. It was Benjamin Franklin back then who said, in wine there is wisdom, in beer there is freedom, and in water there is bacteria. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what they were doing. You would, oh, you, and, you, and it was legal for everybody, you, you, you would make beer or ale out of the grains in your, in your fields. You would also make wine from the fruits in your fields. And most people in, in uh, our area back then had peaches. Peaches, uh, a peach orchard will be thriving in just several years. And so they made peach wine. And of course this, beet, this ale and, and wine is only like 2% alcohol. It's not gonna last very long in a piece of pottery with a corn cob on top of it. So what are you gonna do to make it last to the next crop or through? You're gonna distill it. And it was legal for everybody, every farmer, every person to have a 50 gallon or less pot still. So you would take that wine, put it into the, to the copper pot still, and you get brandy. Now brandy will last through the winter, because right, it's higher proof. You would take the ale, put it through, and you get whiskey. And that's why they did it, right? Because it's tough. You wake up, you might need a shot just before you start working. You might need a shot when you get home, right? Because you've been working all damn day. And then you, you might get a cut, so you, pour it on yourself. This is medicinal. <laughs> it's, it heals from the inside out and the outside in. Mm. So there's the genesis. What do you think? Smoother than you thought it was going to be? Yeah. Absolutely. So decades go on. Huh? This took a while. This is an evolution. And as the town grows, they're at the falls of the Ohio, and after the Revolutionary War, which is why we're there, because the falls of the Ohio is why the whole city is there, because you had to portage your boat. You had to put your boat on the bank and portage it down Main Street, two miles down, and put it back in the, in the river. So that's why we're there. You had to stop your boat. They named the city after the French royal family, that uh, king that lent us the money to defeat the British in the Revolutionary War. That would be King Louis XVI. Yeah. Um, King Louis XIV is what St. Louis is named after, so that's an older city than Louisville is, right down the, the Ohio River. Uh, and then we named a, a, a county after the French royal family, um, so Bourbon County, so King Louis Bourbon, that's his last name. So right there we have kind of a recipe, because corn is prevalent in our area, and it's the crop that grew 
most readily. In the north, it was rye. So here around Pennsylvania, about around Virginia, George Washington was making a rye whiskey. Right? Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, they were making rye whiskey. They had corn too, but rye was more prevalent up here. So like I said, nobody thought about these recipes and said, hey, I'm gonna make mine X amount of percent, 80% corn, and then nobody thought about that. It's what's growing, what can I do it with? Because I gotta live. Huh? So that's why they did it. So corn became different. It was much sweeter than the unaged rye whiskey they had up north here. And they said, this is something. Around 1810, 1815, 1820, ah, the country's growing. And uh, they're making, some people are making this whiskey, Evan Williams, other folks, Elijah Craig, and they, uh, they're going to ship it down the river. There's two major outposts that you could trade with. Most of the goods that we got came from Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, came down the Ohio River. Okay, everybody knows the three rivers outside of Pittsburgh. The Ohio, the Allegheny, and the Monongahela. And then they come down. And then everything was shipped in these barrels. So Thomas Broadhead is the first guy. He owns the general store in, in, in Louisville. So Evan Williams, if, if, you're, if you're Evan Williams and you need barrels, you go to him because he had stuff that was brought on those rafts and in barrels. And because there was no refrigeration, they treated them. So they didn't want the stuff inside to go bad. So they would put brine or salts or vinegars in there. Okay. Well, if Evan Williams wanted to buy a barrel and put his whiskey in it and send it down to St. Louis and then to New Orleans, he'd buy one of those barrels, but you didn't want to put your good whiskey into a barrel that had pickle juice in it. So they burned the inside of it out. And they burned it inside out. That changed everything. They didn't really know it was changing things, but that was a game changer. They didn't know it till later when they were starting to get letters back saying, who this changed the whiskey. Okay. So when you burn the inside of a barrel, <clears throat> even though this barrel's been cut and everything, it still has sugars in the wood. And when you burn it, those sugars, they come to the, to where the, uh, the you know, burning, a uh, charring means that the, the wood actually catches fire. And then the caramelized sugar sets up in a layer between the uh, wood and the char. So just if I'm toasting a marshmallow and get the marshmallow near the fire, it just toasts it. But if you burn the marshmallow, it caramelizes all that sugar, and you really get those sugars coming. Same thing's happening in the inside of a barrel. As this whiskey, corn whiskey, got into this barrel, sat on this raft in the middle of the Ohio River, and the sun beat down on it, it made those alcohol molecules and water molecules expand, going into the porous oak, adding color. And at night, it gets cold on the river. Even in July and August, it gets cold on the river. It squeezes it back through. So our first rick houses were the boats. So it was the barrel and the magic that happened with the sun and the cool. And then you get this second whiskey, which is mellow corn. When it got down to New Orleans and St. Louis, it looked more like this. Now this isn't a deep amber color like bourbon we know today, because today, the modern laws of corn whiskey state that if you age it, remember I said you didn't have to, we have Georgia Moon. If you do it, it must be aged in a used charred barrel. That's the law. We're not doing it to save money. That's the law. You can also age it in a brand new uncharred barrel. Um, we use a used Evan Williams barrel because barrels are expensive just like they were 200 years ago. So we pay $170 for each barrel. So we're going to get one hit out of it and use it for Evan Williams. And then when we dump that barrel, we're going to fill it one more time with this same exact corn whiskey, which is a little bit different recipe than our bourbon. It's got 2% more corn in it. And then we get this nice light straw color. Now this is aged for four years. This is a bottle and bond corn whiskey. Back then it took about 10 months to get down from Louisville to New Orleans. So it had a little bit more color to it. Like it still had color to it. When we smell this, we're still smelling corn, but it's got a little bit of those barrel notes, and the biggest barrel notes you get is vanilla, honey, and caramel. So we're gonna, get a, we're gonna get the same corn. The science that's happening inside of a barrel, if you age it in a, if you age a corn distillate in a brand new charred barrel, 
The corn flavor becomes neutral, and the only thing that remains is the sweetness, and you have bourbon or you have rye. That's a charred new barrel. But if you age it in a used barrel, the corn flavor still remains. And that's why it's a law that you must age it in a used barrel. Because we want that corn flavor because we're making corn whiskey. So this is mellow corn, four-year-old bottle and bottle. Still taste the corn? We taste a little vanilla, yep. a little honey, a little caramel. It's all in front of your palate still. It's all very sweet. Even though there's 8% rye in here, I don't really taste much spice because it's a brand new, it's not, we're, not, we're not using a brand new barrel, we're using a used barrel. Think of a barrel as a magnifier of flavors. A used barrel hasn't magnified many flavors, but it's augmented the sweetness, right? So we've got 92% sweet with 80% corn and 12% malted barley in, in this recipe. And we only have 8% spice, which has not been magnified by a brand new barrel. So we have 92% sweet, and it's very front of your palate. Mm -hmm. It's very pleasant. Yeah. This is a great whiskey. This is a real unknown whiskey. Are people going to walk in and say, hey, I want a mellow corn? Well, a few of us might. <laughs> <laughs> this is a bartender darling, by the way. It's, it's truly a bartender dar darling. I, I think I've got the only uh, mellow corn phone case in the world. Uh, and this is a cl clear case and a, and, a, and a label. We don't have a big budget for mellow corn. But I was over in London for cocktail week last year. Mm. And this bottle, because of import taxes, and they have a higher tax on anything that's 100 proof or higher, another 10 pounds a bottle, uh, this goes for 45 pounds in London. And they love it. But they told me, they had a little, they had a little pushback for me, and they said, Benny, um, we love mellow corn, but for the price, we do not think that the bottle and label is very posh. And I said, well, I agree with you. It's not posh at all. Yeah. But look at that. See right there on this bottle? It says copyright 1945. Now, we have never changed this label. This is the Medley family crest from the Medley distillery. We don't even own that distillery. We have nothing to do with that distillery, right? But this is what the label was. And Max's and his dad's uh, philosophy was, don't mess it up. People who love mellow corn are going to buy mellow corn next year. And we're getting one more hit out of the barrel. So we love it. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I said, this is authentic. We've never changed this since 1945. And they go, oh, never change it. It is posh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to shine a light on it, right? We're all used to great packaging. But what's, what's, what, everybody wants the cool old packaging, right? Well, here it is. It's pretty cool. So that's mellow corn. Any questions on how bourbon came? You know, I describe, I describe uh, mellow corn as the catfish that crawls out of the lake onto the ground. It's the missing link. Right? Before we get to it. So here we are on that evolution. This is an important link. Right? If it wasn't for mellow corn and aged corn whiskey, we would not have bourbon today. Yeah? And they weren't calling it bourbon back then. They just called it whiskey. They may call it corn squeeze-ins, right? things like that. They didn't call anything bourbon. They didn't call anything bourbon until the mid-1850s or so. There was a gentleman named Ben Poor, and Ben was down securing business for his employer. Like here, I woke up this morning, my flight was at 8 o'clock. Here, I'm here by 1230. Yeah? It took Ben probably a couple weeks to, to, to ride down on horseback. I'll be here all week. I go home Friday. He's probably in Louisville for several weeks at a time, calling on different folks. He got to know the people in the area, got invited to dinners, got invited to things. And they have, a, they have a historical record of he stood up in a, at a party. He said, uh, everywhere, sirs. I'm greeted by gentlemen, gentlemen with their hearts in their right hand, their right hand in mine, and surely in their left, a bottle of unequaled old bourbon. That was 1857. So we know by then it has a name. And the reason it has a name is because on the ends of these barrels, they would put the name of the port that it left from. And in Kentucky it would be Old Bourbon, Kentucky was the port. And of course, you can't see through a barrel, so they put the contents was whiskey. So down in New Orleans, when they said, well, I just... I just don't want whiskey, which was clear. I want this good Kentucky bourbon, right? this bourbon whiskey from Kentucky. However they said it, that's how they ordered it from the barrel, because we didn't put anything in bottles. We just shipped a barrel to your, to your establishment. Yeah. So that's how it got its name. And it took, it took years for that to, you know, we didn't have Facebook and Twitter. Right? So it didn't spread, but it took decades. That's why it stuck, because everybody just called it that, you know? 
The next whiskey we're gonna taste is how other grains got put into the recipe. So we had corn whiskey. We know we're gonna corn. Corn's the summer grain. Corn doesn't grow in the winter. And it's the biggest grain. It's also the sweetest grain. It's the biggest, it's the starchiest, so it has the most sweetness in it. It also, it's really good to use because it has more yield. When you're as a, as a distiller, you look for how many gallons you get out of a bushel, okay? So if you get five gallons out of a bushel, it's better than getting two gallons out of a bushel. You know, rye's real small grain. Barley's a real small grain. Yeah. Corn's a big grain. It's also sweet. Well, corn doesn't grow in the wintertime. What are you going to put in your, in your beer and ale in the wintertime? Winter grains. The second largest grain that grows in Kentucky? Wheat. Yeah. So it's certainly when it got into the recipes. Now this is Larceny Bourbon. This is a small batch uh, variation uh, extension from the old Fitzgerald brand that we acquired when we bought our facility in 1999. This is a weeded bourbon recipe. This is 68% corn. This is 20% wheat and 12% malted barley. Wheat is really not a flavorful grain. I call it the vodka of, of bread, right? It's, uh, it's, it really doesn't have a flavor, but it brings out the sweetness of the barley and the corn. So when I smell this and taste this, and this is a true bourbon under today's standards, so this is all a brand new charred oak barrel, we are going to taste those vanilla honey and caramels will be magnified. So we taste this, smell this and taste this, there's that bourbon smell that, you, that you're familiar with. When we taste it, those vanillas, honey and caramels, but no spice in the back of your palate as 90% of the bourbon whiskey market is. This is still all palate forward, all the front of your palate. Again, nobody was putting recipes together too much, right? if you're making it in your yard. Folks were starting to make whiskey on purpose. Joseph Washington Dant, uh, you had Henry McKenna in 1855, one of our, Don's our, one of our brands just got voted not only bourbon of the, of the year this year, but whiskey of the year out in San Francisco this year. Um, and uh, Dr. James Crow put a lot of science into it. So you are coming up with some recipes and some ways to do things. Um, and it found its way into, and the wheat found, finds its way into recipes because of that fact that it's made in the winter time. It's, it, you could do it in the winter time. Very nice, smooth, easy. Any questions on these first three whiskeys? Yeah. So now we're going to late 1800s. There are no laws controlling any thing in the United States when it comes to consumer goods. So you can do anything you want. Uh, you can basically, when it, when it came to making whiskey, you could just buy uh, neutral grain spirits, Everclear, if you will. You can buy that pretty cheaply. You can then put it together. Then you can have your own recipes to make your own whiskey. If you were making whiskeys and didn't want to age very long, you could do the same thing or just put some younger whiskeys in there, add colors. On a farm, everybody had iodine. Iodine, you have animals. You get a lot of cuts and scrapes. You get a lot of injuries and stuff. Every farm, if you had, and everybody had uh, hogs, uh, at least one hog, everybody had cattle, everybody had things, and you got hurt yourself. So iodine, you could just put that into the whiskey, and it turns it an amber color. And they used iodine. There's, there's all these recipes that you can look back and you see. So Mike Veach wrote a book that's uh, Bourbon Whiskey and American Heritage. Uh, it was... Um, you use tobacco spit from uh, uh, saloons and put that in the fermenter, right? Give it a little texture, right? You get iodine, strong coffee, strong tea. Right? You can add these different colors and flavors, make it look, smell, and taste like whiskey, and then you can slap a whiskey label on it. Then you have to be a certain strength. Yeah? So you never know what you're buying. Nobody was, the only people that were bottling whiskeys were those kind of unscrupulous whiskeys. The people who made straight bourbon sent the barrels down. I don't know where that came from. Straight from the barrel, perhaps. Straight whiskeys, all the color and a lot of the flavor came from the barrel. So, straight whiskeys, and then they called those compound whiskeys. 
Today we would call them blended whiskeys, and you can add caramel colors. You can add, we don't use iodine and tobacco spit anymore. You know, you can use safe colors. But back then, that's what was going on. So several people in Kentucky and the surrounding area said, we need to have a law. Let's make a law, and then we can say, we, we make the, the best quality whiskey. So they lobbied for, and they found an advocate uh, here in Washington, D.C., and that advocate was John Carlisle. If you watch Boardwalk Empire, he's, he's in there. Uh, John Carlisle was from Kentucky. He's the Secretary of Treasury of the United States. Why is he important? Because his treasury agents held the keys of the distillery, which levied the taxes, because after the Civil War, there was taxes levied to pay off, pay off the debt, and they just kept the tax. So there's been a whiskey tax ever since, and his agents held the keys. So that's why he's important. They lobbied for and got and passed March 3rd, 1897, the Bottle and Bond Act. A watershed moment for whiskey, especially in American spirits. Bottle and Bond states, and I, everybody at their, at their seat has this card. On the back of that card are all the laws for Bottle and Bond. So you, you don't even have to memorize them. You can just keep this card with you and you'll always know what Bottle and Bond is. So, this was the very first consumer protection legislation passed in the history of the United States, nine years before we cared about the safe labeling of our food in the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. We cared more about the quality of our whiskey. That's why it's great to be an American, right? So, if you're going to be bottle and bond, which, which Mellow Corn is, which Evan Williams Bottle and Bond is, which Rittenhouse Rye is, it has to come from the same uh, spirits, the same class of materials. So I can't mingle corn whiskey with rye whiskey. It's got to stand on its own. Right? Same distilling season. There's two distilling seasons. There's a spring season and a fall season. So the, the spring season is January through June. The fall season is, is July through December. So I can only use barrels that I distilled and filled between a six month period. It's a finite number of barrels. That's why it's going to be a small brand. It's not going to be a huge multi-million case brand. Be a small little segment of a brand. It has to be from the same distillery. So only one distillery. Stored for a minimum of four years. So I have to age it. I'm guaranteed a good age. I have to reduce and proof by pure water only. No iodine, no tobacco spit, nothing. But pure water. And to exactly 100 proof, which is a proof gallon, which is how the government made their money. A uh, proof gallon is 50% alcohol to one gallon of 50% alcohol. So, I'm guaranteed a good strength. So you hear how this could be good? I'm guaranteed a good age, I'm guaranteed a good strength, and it's pure. Well, I'm in, right? Yeah. Then, it must bear the real name of the distillery. So on the back here, it says, distilled by, and bottled by Old Evan Williams, which is our trade name. This one says, distilled in, and bottled by Heaven Hill Distilleries, which is the name of our distillery. We can use both. So it's still confusing, right? Even it came from one, you know what clears it all up? We have to put our DSP, our Distilled Spirits Plant Number. And I'll pass this around. This says, distilled and bottled by Evan, Hill, Evan Williams, DSP, KY, and the one. And then if you bottle it at a separate plant, you have to put that on there. That says DSP, KY, 31. Remember our distillery burned down, but our bottling facility is at a different facility. So... The DSP KY1 is in, in our Bernheim facility in downtown Louisville, Kentucky, and DSP KY31 is in Bardstown. That, I have no questions. When I look at a bottle of bottle and bond, I know exactly who made it. I know how old it is. I know how strong it is. I know it's very restricted. So when I look at a bottle and it says whiskey, bourbon, straight, those all have laws. They're like Boy Scouts earning badges or military men and women earning medals. You have to earn the whiskey badge. You have to earn the straight badge. That means it's been aged for two years. It's not corn whiskey, it's bourbon whiskey. You have certain laws for that. But if it says bottle and bond, it has to pass all these. So this is the Eagle Scout of, of whiskeys. It's the Green Beret or Navy Seal. It's got all the medals. It's got all the badges. Why wouldn't you want every single one? So let's taste these together. So take your Evan Williams bottle and bond, 
and your written house rye bottle and bond and put one put the Evan Williams in your left hand and the written house in your right hand these are made with the same three grains corn rye and barley but at different percentages bourbon must be at least 51 percent corn and this is this is 78 percent corn rye whiskey must be at least 51 percent rye and it is this is 51 percent rye so this has 10 percent rye in it 78 percent corn this has 35 percent corn and 51 percent uh, rye rye is spicy so there's more corn in here, so this, this, this bourbon in our left hand is going to be, in my mind, sweeter. The one in my right hand, the rye whiskey, is going to be spicier, and boy is it, okay? So we taste the Evan Williams, and these are great to compare with each other because they're both four years old and 100 proof. It's apples to oranges. You can't, it's hard to compare a three-year-old against a six-year-old. It's hard to compare an 80, 80 proof against a 100 proof. These are both four years old and 100 proof. That's that classic traditional bourbon whiskey. That spice is, 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 is really right there in the back of my palate instantly with the vanilla, honey, and caramel up front right in your face. The rye whiskey is an explosion of spice with a finish of vanilla, honey, and caramel. So in your all's world, when you're putting together a cocktail list, when you taste these, different drinks pop in your head. These are both great products. You're going to need them both. Do I carry one or the other? You've got to carry them both. Because this is going to, I had a, had a buyer in, in Austria, and you know, they didn't have a whole lot of whiskeys on their back bar, and the whiskey is really hitting them over in, in Europe really well. Loves Rittenhouse Rye. I would say Rittenhouse Rye is the most sought after rye whiskey in the world. And I say it because I, I travel a lot internationally, and it's always a darling on the back bar at any mixology account. Um, and I said, hey, he goes, he goes, I, I, I love Rittenhouse. He says, but I don't need, I, I got other bourbons. I don't, I don't need Evan Williams bottle and bond. Now that is pushback from a buyer, right? I don't need, I don't need this at all, he said. I said, well, why not? He goes, well, I got, you know, I got Jim Beam. I got Jack Daniels. I got, you know, they, you know they got Bullet, you know. There's only have a few over there. And I said, I thought, I thought you liked Rittenhouse rye. I said, yeah. I said, why? He goes, well, when I'm making a cocktail, it's not just 80 or 90 proof or 86 proof. It's 100 proof. It stands up in that cocktail. So when I uh, make a Manhattan and I put ice in it and I put the vermouth in and I stir it and it makes water, he goes, he goes it stands up in that cocktail. It's not dissipating. I said, sure. So why are you telling me you don't need the written house of bourbon? He goes, what? I said, well, you make <coughs> bourbon cocktails, right? Goes, well, yeah. Why don't you want the written house of bourbon? Oh, he had to think about it, right? I don't know if he bought it, but it's, it's not a line. It's true. I mean, there's a true difference in the flavor of these, right? And it's phenomenal, right? There's 2,000 registered craft distillers in the United States making at least one to three labels of American whiskey. <coughs> there's 10 major distilleries making, well, we have 50 or 60. Other ones have no. So there's probably four to 6,000 labels of American whiskey on the market today. How many bottle and bonds are there? Any guess? Nationally, from all distilleries? It's, it's changed. The, the most I can come up with is 33. And most of those you can't get because they're from a, a smaller little distillery that only has a little bit of it. So there's probably only 15 or 16 you can get in any one market. Of those, Heaven Hill makes 10. We're one third of that universe. <clears throat> Pretty cool. When somebody says, I'm gonna start a bourbon bar in my house, which bourbon should I buy? I'm gonna open a whiskey bar in my hotel or a whiskey bar in my city. Which should I start with? I said, buy every bottle and bond you can get your hands on and build out from there. Why wouldn't you put every Navy SEAL and Green Beret on your back bar? Why wouldn't you put every Eagle Scout and build out from there? Here's a, here, we got corn whiskey right here. We've got rye whiskey right here. We've got bourbon whiskey right here. There's three of them. 
Pretty cool. And then you're going to make cocktails with them. You need that higher proof anyway. So next time you're behind this bar here, grab a bottle of mellow corn and make a Paloma with it. It's amazing. It's really good. It doesn't work with every tequila drink, but it works good on that one. And let me tell you, these are not expensive. You would think that a Navy SEAL and the Green Beret would be the most expensive. It's not. A bottle of Evan Williams bottle of bonds, like 15 bucks, 16 bucks. A bottle of Mellow Corns, less than 15 bucks. A bottle of Rittenhouse Rives, under 25 bucks. We get that as a family owned company. Our company knows what bottle and bond is. I don't have to tell the brand director what it is. I don't have to tell an owner what it is. They tell me the, they tell me the, the restrictions. I don't have to explain it to a brand manager you know, who was just selling you know, deodorant six months ago. It's a cool thing about being a family owned company. We know what these things are. We know what you all need. Yeah. Uh, and this is it. The bottle, the bottle and bond is the way to go as you're starting out. But also plays in the evolution. Because if it wasn't for the Bottle and Bond Act, we'd all just be drinking Seagram 7 today. Yeah. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with Seagram 7. But it's not what people are coming up to your bar and asking for and wanting to know the differences in, right? It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. So we had a good thing going on. We had, gosh, we have the Bottle and Bond Act. Things are happening. It's like good things are going to happen to us now. It's like the movie The Jerk. Remember the movie The Jerk? Good things are going to happen to me now. And then it just all falls apart, right? Because then we had 14 years of prohibition. And after 14 years of prohibition, we had to build distilleries. And that's when Canadian whiskey, as I said before, and Scotch whiskey and Irish whiskey, they never had the prohibition. So boom, they just over, overtake us. And we never, even though whiskey was a big deal, but let's not forget, there was only four spirits you could really get in the United States in the 40s and 50s. There was rum, there was gin, there was brandy, and there was whiskey. And then there was cordials. But there's really only four spirits you can walk into the Mont Monteleon Hotel in 1940 and buy, right? or the Round Robin Bar at the Willard Hotel and buy in 1940. Those four. It wasn't until Smirnoff Vodka comes out and we got vodka in the United States in the 1960s. And then the, the, the two punch, the one two punch, the one was vodka and the other one was tequila. So imagine not having that to, to, to compete against. And that's why we just kind of almost went to the great liquor store in the sky. And we were just floundering. We didn't know what to do. Yeah. Other distilleries start to, you know, they, they lower the proofs. Bottle and bond's too strong maybe. Those gins, the gin's like 90 some proof. Um, then our people are coming up, the vodkas and the tequilas are 80 proof. Maybe that's the problem. Let's lower it to 80 proof. That's eh, too low. Let's go 86. It's not, that's, the lowest you can go is 80. Let's just go 86. Right? So most everything went to 86 proof. It's not the lowest. That's, that's the only thing I, I can find out. Right? And to this day, that didn't help. It killed. To this day, when you kill something or do away with something, you, you've 86'd it. Right? And that's one of those expl explanations of how that came to be. It wasn't until a group of visionary old geezers of distillers, old grizzled guys at distilleries like Booker No and Parker Beam at our distillery and Lincoln Henderson at Brown Foreman and Elmer T. Lee at Ancient Age and Jimmy Russell at, at, at Wild Turkey decided they were going to come out with these, you know, because the stuff got older. Remember? As, as it gets older, and they didn't want to do decanters anymore. So in 1984, Blanton's comes out, first single barrel bourbon. Uh, it was $19.99 a bottle, only available in Kentucky. And just to help it a little bit, they did put it into a decanter. They put it into a little collectible bottle, and on the writer's uh, boot had a letter that spelled out Blanton's. Still there today. So it's still a little bit of a gimmick, right? Because that's how much it had, and it sat on shelves and got dusty. Nobody bought it. $19? Are you crazy? I can get a bottle of anything, Jim Beam, Heaven Hill, anything for $5 a fifth. I'm going to spend four times the amount? You've got to be crazy. Right? And it sat there and got dusty. Two years later, Elijah Craig comes out. It has 12-year age statement on it. It's 94 proof. 
We put a big red number 12 on it. We're not hiding the age anymore. Not a decanter. We're just going to just see if it sells. In true Heaven Hill style, $9.99 a bottle. Sat on shelves and got dusty. Nobody trusted the older whiskey. This is a 34-year overnight success. Right? It's crazy. Booker's came out. Booker said, hey, let's... Uh, you know, Booker didn't like anything over nine years old. That's why Knob Creek was nine years old and Booker's was six to eight years old. He, he liked that sweet spot, but he said, I'm a, I see people's eyes light up when they put their glass under the barrel at the, in the distillery. Let's make it barrel proof. Well, people didn't want strong back then. And they, you think they loved it? No. Booker's was like a 3,000 case brand forever. It was $50. Whoa, that's something. Wow. It took years and years and years for this stuff to take off. When I joined the company in 2012, Elijah Craig was a 12,000 case brand. Put it in that perspective, uh, Woodford and Knob Creek are 600,000 case brands. This was 12,000 cases seven years ago. It's a quarter million cases now in just seven years. That's how good I am. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I mean, people have caught, now people want older whiskey from you. You know, that's one reason why we took the age statement off. You know, Knob Creek had a, have, had a nine year, it doesn't have an age statement now. You think they're the largest bourbon company in the world, they can't keep a nine year age statement? You think we can keep up with 12? But you know, we started eight. This has eight, nine, 10, 11, and 12 year old whiskey into it. Picture it this way 300 barrel dump. There's 50 barrels of eight year old, 50 barrels of nine year old, 50 barrels of 10 year old. Then we have 11 and 12 year old whiskey. There's 75 barrels of 11 year olds, 75 barrels of 12. That's not exact, but that's about right. Yeah. So there's a lot of older whiskey in this still. So when we smell this and taste this, you can know why this one whiskey of the year two years ago at Whiskey Advocate Magazine and Whiskey Fest, the barrel proof version of this one, whiskey of the year, not bourbon of the year, whiskey of the year. Yeah. Smell this and taste this. I enjoy it even more than a 12 year old used to be because it was really woody and spicy. I love that. This is actually with the, with, the, with the depth and complexity of the different ages in it, really makes it more approachable for more people and really is a bold whiskey. Think of the 10 year old whiskeys you have on your back bars right now around the, around the world in your bars. Of the American bourbons, how many, let's just name them. What do you think? 10 year old, age dated. I'll start with ours, Henry McKenna, 10 year old, and just got whiskey of the year. Nobody cares about awards till you win them. <laughs> Bullet has a 10 year old, hey, we're running out. Um, <laughs> yeah, Wathens has one I think, or seen there's like four bottles of that in the world. Yeah, Eagle Rare. Michter's has one, it's about $800, right? <laughs> I mean, they're expensive, right? And, they're rare. and there's only what, five, let's say there's six. This starts at eight and goes to 12? Gosh, if this isn't on your back, you know, consumers are telling us this is what they want. 12,000 cases seven years ago, quarter million cases. You wanna be ahead of the curve? You wanna be the high of the curve. If this isn't on your bar, people know about this brand. People who walk up to a bourbon bar, they know this brand. They didn't know it five years ago, they know it today. And this needs to be on every bar. Mm. And this is the same whiskey as Henry McKenna, which was named bourbon, bourbon of the year and whiskey of the year, which is the same whiskey as Evan Williams. It's just younger. Why wouldn't you want that on your bar? Evan Williams, the number two selling bourbon in the world, you know, I only ask for one thing. We have our salespeople and our distributor partners and they're gonna ask you for everything. I don't know how you all do what you do because you ask for a lot of things, right? That's their job, be the squeaky wheel. I'm gonna ask you for one thing. You should put Evan Williams on your bar. I'm telling you, it's the number two selling bourbon in the world. There's only one bourbon now sells it, it's Jim Beam. You know who made it number two in the world? Consumers. One out of 10 bottles that leaves a liquor store in the United States is Evan Williams. 
So 10% of your customers, and if there's two people live in that house, that's 20%. So between 10 and 20% of your customers who walk up to any one of your bars, this is what they drink at home. Why wouldn't they want to see it on your back bar? How many brands can you say that about? That 10 to 20% drink it at home. They're glad to see it, right? We gotta get over that this is a bottom shelf cheap whiskey. It is not. It is clearly the world's number two selling bourbon in the world, which means it outsells Maker's Mark, which is a phenomenal bourbon. It outsells Wild Turkey. It outsells Bullet, the largest spirits company in the world. They might overtake us one day. Thank God our goal is not to be the number two selling bourbon in the world. <laughs> <laughs> because they probably are. Those big companies probably will pass this up. But the consumer has made this the number two selling bourbon in the world and they're walking into your establishments. Why wouldn't you have it on the back bar? And then I'll tell you on top of it, that it's 12 bucks a bottle and change. And I don't know how much you get for a bourbon and Coke in your places, but you're probably making money on the second pour with Evan Williams. Can you say that about other brands? You're making profit on the second pour. That's pretty powerful. So that's what we show up with as a family owned company where we can't say, hey, we're gonna give you all this, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in support and all kinds of stuff. It's in the bottle. We've given you the support, it's in the bottle. You gotta figure out how to get it out of that bottle. But we're done there, right? Because we're gonna make the good whiskey for you and we're gonna have some great support as in, you know, people like me and people like, you know, other things, but, but money-wise, it's in there. And you just gotta figure out how to get it out. Right? And that's why Evan Williams in New York is the number one selling bourbon in the state and in Manhattan because a bar this size of Manhattan is 20 grand a month. And they have figured out how to get that money out of this bottle. And their customers walk up and order a bourbon and Coke and they're charging eight, nine bucks for it. And they're not gonna put up with a three-year-old 80 proof in the well or just a cheap, cheap blended whiskey or cheap thing in the well. They want something good. And they've chosen Evan Williams because they know it makes them money, people like it, and it's what they're drinking at home. So, I'll get off my soapbox now. Cheers. 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 Mm. So have you enjoyed tasting through the evolution of bourbon? Had to put into your mind a little bit more of what bourbon is and where we came from? Yep. Going from unaged corn whiskey to the aged corn whiskey, and then seeing how wheat came into the equation, and then the Bottle and Bond Act and how that affected him, and then the, the small batch and single barrel burns are brought back. Cool. Well, any questions? I know we've gone through a lot, but any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. What's your take on uh, DC or like local areas nowadays making bourbon? It's awesome. So just like just like um, craft whiskey did, I mean craft beer did. But you know, I was really fortunate. You know, in this industry, we get a little we we, we get a lot of really great opportunities that happen to us, and we get to drink with some really cool people and have dinners with people. I got to have dinner with uh, Jim Cook at Epcot Food and Wine a few years ago who started Boston Brewing at uh, Samuel Adams. And he told me that um, the number one, he asked me what the number one selling wine in 1969 was. And I, of course, I didn't know, but it was Thunderbird. And uh, you know, like Mad Dog 2020, just cheap. I mean, but you know, you could see it volume, it just didn't. So the, what, what, what uh, California vineyards did for the wine industry, he saw happening. He said, well, I can do that with beer because beer, and my family was in a beer business, it was controlled by basically the same four companies that control it now. But consumers have told us they want other things. So I came up with this, the way I look at things is the life sentence of drinking is over. So let's look at those past and see there were brands and specific drinks that people drank their entire life. One of them, seven and seven. Right? That was a life sentence for a lot of people. Right? It's all they drank all their life. We can think of a few other ones, right? There's still a few powerful brands out there, and we all, we, Evan Williams is a powerful brand. We, we, Jack and Coke is another one. Bacardi and Coke is another one. Tanqueray and Tonic, right? Yeah. Malibu Pineapple, right? There's people, that's their drink. And if you didn't have it at your house, they left. Or they brought their own bottle, right? But that's not going on anymore. 
somebody walks into your bar, especially younger drinkers, the life sentence is over. They have, they have, they have, I have a go-to, but they don't have a life sentence. Uh, the, the, the people that drink Miller Lite don't drink Miller Lite because it's a Pilsner. The people who drink Miller Lite don't even know it's a Pilsner. Huh? It's Miller Lite. But there's people who want the local Pilsner. There's people who want to taste the local thing. So that's what the local distilleries are doing. They're putting a light on the regional, but they can never make enough whiskey to give you a whiskey that you can put on your bar and make money with. Because it, they kind of show you how expensive it is to make good whiskey. So you need larger distilleries like us to make money with, because you're in the bar and restaurant business, not the bar and restaurant charity. And it's very expensive to build a $120 million distillery. We make 1,300 barrels a day. I'll put it in that perspective. Flew down to New Orleans uh, Bourbon Festival with Trey Zoller from Jefferson's. You know, he's an awesome guy. Trey's a great guy. You, you know Trey. He's a super nice guy. Castle Brands, last, semester, last quarter of last 2018, posted $1.26 profit for the whole company for three, three, three months. And the main expenditure, they explained, was a 750 barrels that they purchased to feed Jefferson's. We make 1,300 barrels a day. In three months, they bought 750 barrels. And it was a major expenditure. That's a half day's production for us. So it's the smaller local brands that are gonna put that emphasis on, hey, we're this area. We make good whiskey too. But it's $60 a bottle for a two-year-old whiskey. It's kind of hard. But you gotta support them. But it's gonna be used differently. Our brands are workhorses. Our brands are in there. We want you, we, you know, no one, you know, someone might not even walk in and say, give me a Rittenhouse ride, but boy, you put that on a feature drink list, it's gonna go. You put Evan Williams on a feature drink list and you make it the old fashioned with it or whatever you make with it, it's gonna sell and no one's gonna complain. And there's profit. And on that one, there might be profit on the first pour in some of those, those cocktails that you make. That's hard to say about a lot of things. So we know where our brands need to be for you all. Mm. We've only been uh, going for the uh, on-premise for the last five years. We're new to this, but we know we have something special because we have brands that make money. Now we don't show up with, you know, we're not Daddy Warbucks and we don't show up throwing money around, which frustrates a lot of our salespeople and a lot of our distributors, but the ones that get it really understand there's a lot of 